Um, but a quick background. Um, so Groupon, uh, we're in 48 countries. Um, we have um, quite a few different deals happening at any given point in time. Um, and in general, um, half, this, half of what we see, or a lot of what we see, amounts to free money. Um, it's discounts, but it's things that can stack. It's, it's um, basically ways to game the system is, is, is half of uh, you know, what we have to deal with. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today and about some other stuff. Um, but we actually are powered by Nginx. Um, we have lots of different stuff. We have Akamai. We have load balancers and other things. But at the core, um, our app servers, our web servers are all Nginx based. Um, but there's kind of a problem, and that's, kind of, and that's what I want to talk about today. Um, I've been searching on the internet for the cheesiest photos I could find, and this is what I came up with. Um, there are people that are trying to do things, right? Malicious intent, uh, not always trying to hack Groupon, right? Yes, we see that. Um, that, will, that will happen when you stand up a, a web server anywhere. Um, but fraud and abuse and other things are also an interesting part of this kind of abuse scenario. Um, but as you quickly find out, um, once you get big enough, it's not this that you have to worry about. It's more of this. Uh, command and control networks, uh, bigger, bigger activity, trying to do a lot more, right? To scale um, the kind of uh, fraud and abuse that's necessary to really game a system, you need lots of computers to do it. Um, and you know, as these computers pop up, they're hard to deal with, right? The general scenario, once you start to see these, is you start to do this, right? Um, but something pops up and you turn it off, and something pops up and you turn it off, and then something pops up and you turn it off. And then when you get big enough, something pops up and you turn it off, and then five more pop up. And you turn one off, and then 10 more pop up. And then all of a sudden, there's way more that you can never control. Um, and really, uh, this robot activity and some of these things are, there's only one way to, to solve the problem, right? You have to automate some of this stuff away. You have to recognize that it's happening and make it go away. Um, but you want to do it in a careful way. Um, at the end of the day, you end up trying to basically create something that means your, my robots fight your robots. And, and one will win at a certain point. But it really is asymmetric warfare, right? Um, our core business model is not defending against robots. Our core business model is giving people deals, right? Um, and so they can spend all their time trying to do what they, got to, what they want to do because that is their core business model, right? Uh, it's not just our site. It's lots of sites. But, um, Really, we ended up with this kind of situation where, you know, originally, yeah, it was IP whack-a-mole. That's, that's how it starts. And then you realize, you know, you, you moved to something different. So I want to give you the kind of backstory on how we went from recognizing there was a problem, essentially recognizing there was a problem, to actually creating a system that tells us what's going on all over the world uh, at any given point in time, um, which has been dubbed group on the defense. But um, we can see at any point who's doing what, who's been blocked for what reasons, uh, we can watch our threats happen in um, near real time. But of course, uh, we didn't just pop up with this one day. There was a long process that got us here. Um, the first edition it was this was uh, Splunk queries and some Perl and a static file on, on Nginx. Um, this really was a test to see what we could do. Um, uh, we kind of ended up here, right? Um, we wanted to figure out what we could do, how, how we could analyze, how we could see what's going on. Um, Really, we actually wanted to slow down carding attacks. The biggest thing we saw right up front was carding attacks. How, how many of you are not familiar with carding attacks or what they are? Uh, how many of you take credit cards online? OK. So those of you that didn't raise your hand for what you know what it is and did raise your hand for credit cards, um, you should look into this. Um, chances are you are probably being carded, uh, almost um, without a doubt being carded. What this is is because you take credit card, you probably have a profile, and they can, somebody could add their credit card to their profile, so that way when they go to check out, it's frictionless, right? You don't have to worry about that. The credit card's on file. You can charge it. The experience is better, right? You, you lose a lot of um, business at that checkout point when somebody fat fingers their credit card, that kind of thing. When you slow them down, and the impulse buys are fantastic, and if we can capture that experience, all the better. But once you put friction in the way, it starts to slow it down. So adding that credit card uh, in order to ensure that it's going to happen and in a way it's going to work later is you validate it. Right? So you say, is this credit card good? You will ask you know, your gateway or whoever, is this credit card good? Can I charge it? And they'll tell you yes or no. And so if you do this and you can find out it's valid, you can then sell that credit card number if you haven't. So, you, so these carding attacks are basically databases of tons and tons of card numbers that just re are repeatedly validated until they find the good ones. And they throw the bad ones out, they sell the good ones on the black market. 
Um, that's what a carding attack is. Um, it would generally fly under the radar. So based on how big you are, how much volume you have, they'll fly under the radar. So unless you're really looking for them, you probably won't notice it. Um, and that was the original kind of goal with this. But then once we realized um, we could do, um, we could just stop these attacks, right? We realized, oh wait, there's, there's behavioral analysis we can do. We can look at traffic, we can look at patterns, we can ask questions, right? Splunk was the original backend for all this. But we realized we can do this for everything, right? And as you keep looking at it, um, you start to think about what else you can do. Um, so some time passed. Um, we thought about a lot of different ways of dealing with this. And we tried a lot of different things. Um, uh, I tried some stuff on my own. There's lots of different things you can look at. Yes, there are WAP appliances. There's all kinds of stuff. But there's nothing that really gives you the ability to have kind of an open set of, of lookup cache for who's being bad and who's being good across your entire organization that you, where you can feed data into it that isn't designed by the WAF company or anything else, right? That open data source. Uh, and this is where RepSheet came from. Um, it basically just turns the model around a little bit. Um, not everything is always combined in a solution, but essentially it's a few things that are embedded in the web server, right? GOP lookup. Uh, if you have a WAF, like a mod security, something like that, you can put it in line. That might be out of line too. Um, WebSheet is a module that sits in there and really does it just, it's managed state, right? There's a globally managed state, uh, happens to be a Redis cache. Um, it looks up what's going on, right? So actor comes in, a, an IP address or a cookie from a user, maybe you have a permalink cookie or something like that. It'll look it up and see, do, what do I know about this actor? Are they good, are they bad, have they misbehaved? What do I wanna do with them? Um, and so it's all managed state, every web server has a, a local copy of this running on, on, their, on their server. Uh, with a global copy behind it. Um, the rep sheet module will do the acting, right? Will they, will they block them? Are they whitelisted? Will they let them through? And then uh, the notion of being marked, which I'll talk about more often, uh, more often later, which helps us change the way we respond. And then stuff you do in the background, the stuff that feeds the cache effectively. Um, how, do I put, how do I take all this data that I've got and I've collected that I've decided good, bad, indifferent, and feed it up to this cache so we can look it up as people come to the front door? Um, rep sheet itself is actually pretty simple. Um, there's Apache and Nginx versions uh, and a shared library. Um, rep sheet's written in C. Um, I'll go into more reasons about that later. We can have the bike shedding hour when we're done. Um, uh, lib rep sheet is the core of this. It's shared across the web server modules and some backend stuff. And then, of course, you need Redis uh, to power it at the moment. Uh, but basically, the rep sheet, just the, the piece built in Nginx, is just a lookup cache and, and the ability to act and decide what's going on. It pulls some information out, asks some questions, lets you go. The point is fast and, uh, and kind of just in line. Uh, what it gives you is dynamic IP and user management. Um, yes, you can feed all this stuff into a cache automated, in an automated fashion, or you can just drop somebody in really quick if you want to. Um, that web interface you saw allows you to manually blacklist people, but you can just dump anything you want in there very quickly. So if you need to blacklist, um, change somebody's access, you can just do it straight in the database, the REST database dynamically. So no restarting configurations or reloading configurations, that kind of stuff. Um, which really was one of the big problems is we need a way to just stuff this thing in right away and have it go without reloading any configurations. Um, but like I said, it looks at IP address and cookie values. Um, so IP address is never as simple as IP address because when you have 15 layers of servers uh, and traffic, you have exported for uh, hops and everything else, so you have to parse all that stuff out. Um, so it'll, it'll take care of X4 and for parsing and, and real IP parsing and all that stuff. And of course, cookie values. So if you want to blacklist a user, because sometimes you'll have one user that will hop IP to IP to IP, um, you can cut their legs off by just having the user go away entirely. Um, it's simple whitelist and blacklist. Uh, that stuff is quite simple. Um, you can do whitelist and blacklist by IP or user or site or block, um, uh, which is like you'd see in Nginx anyways. And then the notion of marked users, which actually is what I really care about here. Um, most important, this is the most important thing to me because uh, our controls, the way we do security um, is mostly static. We don't change what we do based on what we know, we just do it for everybody. Um, when you mark an actor, you can say, hey, I think they're bad. I haven't decided yet, uh, why don't you turn the friction up a little bit? So if they are a robot, it's gonna change how the application responds. Um, and what this gives you is dynamic control, right? You get behavioral changes uh, or user interface changes based on what you know about somebody. Um, it is 2014, we should be able to do these kind of things, right? Everything else dynamic, the way our application responds to 
somebody might be malicious or have the wrong intent, we could respond to them differently than everybody else. Um, the static controls thing for me is a, is a terrible thing. Um, for me, it's actually punishing good users. When we put friction in place because we want to make sure nobody's a, a bad or a robot, what we're doing is saying, I don't know who you are, I, and I want to stop bad robots. Um, so I'm just going to punt, and everybody has to do this, right? CAPTCHA is my favorite example. How many of you love CAPTCHAs? Or use, how many of you use CAPTCHAs, right? Um, somebody's going to raise their hand up a little bit, and you're punishing everybody else, right? A CAPTCHA just punishes everybody else. Uh, half the time, the robots get through it anyways, and um, it makes everybody really mad, because then they can't, they, you get it wrong half the time, right? I was on the plane here, uh, a United Wi-Fi login, uh, or like to, to every single page you submitted, so you submitted your information, there was a CAPTCHA. And you submitted your credit card information, there was a CAPTCHA. I'm on a plane, 38,000 feet in the sky, trying to buy an hour of Wi-Fi. Why, did it, why are there CAPTCHAs, right? What could I possibly be doing with a robot 30,000 feet up on a plane? I don't know. Um, but what we're doing is punishing users um, because we don't know who they are. We're not taking a look at what they're doing. We're not building up information to say, oh yeah, you know what, they're probably okay. Just, just skip the capture for now. Um, and the other thing is, web apps, web applications in general are not the fortress model, right? Back in the day for network security, we had the model of the fortress, right? Keep everything bad out, everything good in. Um, we have this kind of, this big, these big walls, right? And so friction was in place on purpose to make sure only the good people got in. Uh, but we're on the internet. And last time I checked, the internet was not about keeping people out. Right? The whole point is everybody should be able to come and play. Um, and this is a mental model shift for me. Right? I actually think we have the wrong mental model. It is not a fortress. It's a casino. Right? Uh, how many of you have been to a casino? OK, so people raise your hand. Um, when you go into a casino, when you walk through the door, what happens? Nothing. You just walk in, right? You walk in and you play. But what do they do when you're playing? Yeah, they watch you. What do they watch? Mm -hmm. They watch every single thing you do. Um, why? <laughs> yeah, they want to know, do you have bad intent, right? Are you trying to cheat? Um, and there's business intelligence there too, right? How much are you spending? Did you, just, did you just make a lot of money? Maybe we don't want to let you walk out yet, so we'll comp you something, right? There's different things that happen, but there's a lot of intelligence behind watching you, watching what you're doing, right? This model, this idea, has been around for a long time at casinos. It works extremely well. Every casino that's ever been in existence uses this uh, in some varying fashion to understand what's going on. We don't. Um, this is what we should be doing with our web applications, right? This is the kind of thing that the model exists. We have the data, actually. Uh, collecting the data for us is way easier than it is for the casino. Uh, we don't have to watch a human being act, right? All we have to do is look at our logs. The data is all there. We just have to collect it and make sense of it. Um, so the idea is studying behaviors and adapting to the signals from users. Every time a user acts, they're going to give us signals about what their, their next intent, uh, their next step's going to be. Um, and anomaly detection is actually a big part of this. We want to see what's going on. Uh, so I'm going to show you a series of four requests, and I want you to tell me what happened. And then we're going to kind of look at some indicators. So here's the first request. Um, so we have an internal IP, a timestamp, a post slash login, a user agent, and a public IP. And uh, of course, we have a response code, a payload size, that kind of thing as well. So first request that we ever saw from this was a post to slash login. Second request, uh, a post to the credit card endpoint for King Rowan. Um, again, all the other details. Uh, third request, and the fourth request. So what did you guys see? Mm -hmm. What else? No get request to the login. What else? What were they doing? So you saw technical details. 
What I want to see is intent. What, what were they doing? Yeah, it was a carding attack, right? Um, so when I see this pull request, I see a carding attack. Um, that's the point. I don't want, I mean, yes, the details matter. The details help me make that decision. They're data points for a model. But what I really want to do is see a carding attack. I want to see a fraud attempt. I want to see, I want to see an intent, really, right? I want to analyze the behavior. I want to get the intent. I want to figure out the intent that I can act. Uh, but if we replay this, right? Like we said, login request happened. Um, a post with no get. So yes, their IP address could have switched. They could have been on a mobile network. There's a possibility that this alone doesn't indicate a bot. But um, we can look further, right? There was a one second delay between every request. I don't know about you, but I cannot type my credit card information in in one second. Um, unless you have a little form filler, but I can't do that. Um, something else we noticed is the user agent. Um, this user agent is odd. Firefox 8 on Windows 7. Uh, doesn't make sense at all. Uh, now, there are a couple other reasons. I mean, if you looked it up, you'll realize it's, it's kind of a mark of a bot anyways. But uh, Firefox 8, in particular, has a mark of a common web driver tool, Selenium. So you actually can see, oh, maybe this is actually a, a driven thing. And the last thing, um, if we look up where the request came from, right? Uh, it came from Bulgaria. Now, that's not good or bad. Right, um, but on its face. But if you think in the context of where are you now and where, was, where was, what kind of you know, thing is this person trying to purchase or do, uh, does it make sense from where they are versus where this thing actually is, right? Um, if, if, in, if in, for instance, this was a US-based transaction, this would be odd that it would be coming from Bulgaria, right? If it was in Bulgaria, then it would be perfectly fitting. Maybe if it came from the US, it would be odd, right? Um, but you have to look. This is part of the equation. The other things I didn't point out are Every single one of these posts returned a 302. Not a single one of them were followed, right? So the post request happened, but there was no following of, of, of anything here, right? Any proper browser would have followed the 302. Um, so seeing this says this is obviously a robot, right? We, four requests was probably more than enough to know that it was a robot. I care that it was a robot, but I also care what the intent was. So maybe a couple more requests let me know what the intent is. And yes, they got a couple of card offs in, but a couple is okay. Um, the thing that really gives us away is that this happens 10,000 more times. Um, so it really became very obvious um, what this was. But I don't want to wait 10,000 times. I want to rate two or three, know that it's a thing, and, and stop it. Um, there's other things I can do too, right? Maybe uh, they sign up with a username that's very common across um, all the times they do this. Maybe there's permutations. And I actually could know this off the bat when they signed up and just turned the account off before I ever even did anything. Right? There's other things you can do beyond this. But in just this, what else gave it away? Like The volume of requests was obviously a thing. Um, but we hinted at something originally, like right off the bat. There's something that gave us away entirely. That was really easy to spot. What was it? Time delays is definitely one of them. Uh, and that's going to play into the volume uh, uh, and frequency piece, but um, what didn't happen first? There was no what? There was no get request. In fact, what were all of the requests? They were all post requests, right? Um, the distribution of verbs is really important here. If you take a time slice of any part of your traffic at any point in the day and do a distribution, like these numbers I think equal 100%, um, doesn't matter. Uh, the point is there's gonna be some distribution of HTTP verbs in your site. If you slice your entire traffic and then slice a single IP, what's the difference? Right? Do they deviate from normal? And when I say deviate, there's some significant deviation that would cause you to, to think twice about what they're doing. Right? Uh, this is super important because this calculation is really easy and it gives you a ton of information. Um, this distribution question will actually give you um, who's deviating at all, right? If they are using the site like everybody else is, the distribution of HTTP verbs is going to be pretty much the same. Um, when they deviate significantly, there's going to be a reason, right? The reason is not necessarily bad, but there is a reason. That's what we have to figure out, and that comes more to the intent piece, right? If you think of 100% GET requests, it's probably something like a Google bot. Then you look at the user agent and figure that out, right? You don't want to block that. That's bad. Um, you want your site to kind of rank uh, search engines. But, it's not that deviation is bad implicitly, it's that deviation means something and you have to figure it out. 
Um, deviation from expected behavior is actually a clear signal um, pretty much in all cases, except for when it's not. And this is the fun part. Um, so we'll go through an example. Um, uh, 9 a.m. rolls around, and all of a sudden, a single IP address has done like 50 account create requests uh, within a few minutes, maybe 10 minutes. Is this good or bad? Bad, why? Oh, oh, so you said NAT? Yeah, so the question now is, is this a robot, or is this a block of people behind an added IP, right, an office? Um, yeah, it's, and so if you think about the scenario, right, I could paint this in the context of Groupon. Uh, maybe, one, maybe one morning we sent an email out about a deal that was close to them for lunch, and somebody said, hey, we're all gonna go to lunch, everybody buy the Groupon deal. And some people might not have accounts, and they all signed up and bought it, right? That was a very valid response to a thing. Um, but it could have just been somebody, a bot, trying to sign up for a bunch of accounts, too. So you have to figure it out. At this point, now you have to dissect what's really going on here. How do you pick apart this natted possibility or a bot possibility? Um, and that's when you start to look at stuff like the email address. What is the email address of these, these people coming in? Uh, if I compare it to the other email addresses, what does it look like? Um, you know, is it highly normalized? Is it like email1 at gmail.com, email2 at gmail.com, right? Like that kind of stuff will predict an attack. You can actually um, do this pretty easily. Um, how many of you have heard of Levinson distance function? What does it do? Yeah, Com compare me two strings and tell me how different they are, right? The lower the number, the, the, the closer they are. The higher the number, the farther apart they are. It turns out that most bots will do either very, very, very simple uh, modifications of strings where the distance function score is super low, or there'll be randomly generated noise, in which case they're super, super high, right? And everybody else sits kind of somewhere in the middle. So if you were to do this score across everything, you might see an average score of two or 36. And that might indicate, oh yeah, that's probably some bot traffic. Um, where some like 10 to 12 may be a normal uh, routine. Now, it's not guaranteed to work every time, right? Um, but it gives you some indicator of something that might be uh, a distinguishing factor. Uh, now when I say deviation, something is really important to deviation, and that's a strong user experience. The flow, the design of your site, and the path that you put in front of somebody to navigate to where you want them to go is very important. If it's ambiguous, you'll find people going all over the place. It's hard to predict what's going on, whether they're wandering around aimlessly, or they have malintent, uh, if you have not designed a site that drives people to a common conclusion. So user UX is super, super important to getting a clearer signal of, as to deviation from behavior. Sometimes what you're doing is hard to, to kind of drive people in a certain direction, but most of the time, especially in the world of e-commerce, you want somebody to buy something, and there's pretty, a pretty clear path to buying it. So uh, consider UX very, very, very important to creating the kind of information that you want to be able to analyze. If you, if you think about analysis of data, you want a bunch of common data and a bunch of outliers. When you have a bunch of data that's kind of the same but mostly different, the outliers are harder to spot. There's other things we look for, right? Um, really, what it comes down to is knowing your business. Any deviation from normal. Um, and so normal is tough. Um, if I ask every single one of you what normal is from, for a day to day, could you tell me? Most people will tell me no to this answer, right? Uh, there are things preventing you from understanding what normal is. First of all, you have to want to quantify it. Um, but log aggregation is simple, right? Like put everything in one spot and put an, a query analyzer or a query uh, engine on top of it. Um, something like a log stash or a Splunk or Sumo Logic or s some kind of thing lets you just query your logs and say what happened. Give me, tell me everybody that's done this, where this is an outlier, or find me the cohorts in a group of people. Um, these kind of questions are important to be able to ask. If you can't ask these, you can't find out what normal is. Um, so it starts with log aggregation and query. Uh, and then you have to really start to look for, for patterns of normal. So an example of a deviation of behavior. Um, King Rowland, the person who had his uh, credit card endpoint tested, he gets a Gmail account hacked. Um, when you get your email account hacked, what happens? What, what, are you, what have you left open? Everything. Your identity on the internet is tied to an email address, effectively, right? Um, terrible, terrible thing to have happen. But if your email account get, gets hacked, everything you have is exposed. Um, and traditionally, when it happens, somebody will 
send a password reset request. Right? They say, hey, I'm going to change my password. So then they'll, change, they'll get the password reset link, they'll go and log in, and they have your account. Right? If it's a credit card tied to that account, they're going to buy stuff. They're going to change the shipping address. You're going to pay for stuff that's going to go to their location. Um, we, can, we can reduce this. We can't stop it, but we can reduce this. Right? Uh, by something simple, as simple as tracking GeoIP. Where do they log in from last? What, what's the common login locations that they come from when they, when they log in? Um, so again, it's behavior, right? So if we take a look and we realize that King Roland always logs in from Druidia every time. It's always coming from Druidia. But the, the pass reset request, the link that, uh, the, the, the last uh, request came in Spaceball City, right? Never, you never see that before. Um, all of a sudden there's a destructive or modifying action request coming from a place this person has never logged in from before. Um, that's strange, right? That's, that's something that you might not expect. So once you see this, you can change how you respond. You can say, hey, I caught this. This is odd. Uh, it's, a, it's a modification action onto account, especially password, uh, or billing address, shipping address, anything like that at all, right? That would um, maybe involve money. You can change how you respond. You can ask to validate the last four digits of the credit card number on the account. You can uh, have security questions. Um, I don't like those, but you can do that if that's what you do. Um, you can make them call customer service and just do it on the phone manually. Right? There's lots of different things you can do to force an interaction, force a friction that could eventually, potentially stop somebody from walking off of somebody's account. Um, and when I say this, and the reason this is so, so important, is at the end of the day, if you take credit cards and somebody gives you their credit card number and you charge their account and they didn't ask for that, whose fault is it? It's yours. It doesn't matter if they had a really crappy password or if they clicked a, th a link in their email that got their email account hijacked, right? That does not matter at all. What matters is you charge their credit card. So when they call you, they're going to be really mad at you for charging their credit card. They, will pro they probably won't even know their email account got hacked, honestly. I mean, that's usually the case. Um, so it is your fault. Uh, it's, it's on you to, to do this the right way. Um, so this is not going to prevent everything from happening, right? You have to do more here. But, these are simple explanations, simple cases you can think about to stop actually a pretty large volume of this kind of, this kind of problem, right? But then there's the obvious stuff, right? I talked about some fraud, abuse cases. Um, there's just the very, very obvious stuff, the people hitting scan with the free scanners on the internet, right? The script kiddies. Um, use a WAF. Um, now, uh, some of you, when I say make the statement, will cringe in horror and say, no, I don't want to use a WAF. But I want to make a comment here, right? Uh, I want to use the WAF passively. I actually don't want to actively block any traffic at all. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with WAF, Web Application Firewall, uh, a layer seven uh, program that's going to look at the request and see uh, headers, body, uh, query string, anything that's part of the request to see if it contains an attack, right? Lots of times WAFs are signature based. So it'll, it'll be a regex match. Um, uh, the folks from Cloudflare talked about building one in Lua yesterday. It was a good talk. Um, Mod security is a, a commonly used open source one. Uh, they talked about that in the talk too. They kind of wrote their own version. Um, this uh, has, has a high degree of false positives. Regular expressions uh, are big and, and nasty and hairy, and they'll usually include stuff that you don't want to include, which means legitimate traffic will be blocked. You don't want to do that. Um, the whole idea of this is only to block people when you know for certain they should be blocked. Um, really, the idea is that a high rate of pulse positives and really narrow vision, right? This, uh, this, WAF, this WAF in general has one view or part of a view of the world. How many web servers do you have? Do more, anybody have more than one web server? Yeah, okay. So a WAF sees this much of the world, right? And each WAF sees this much of the world, but not the complete picture. You only see a part of it. Now, some WAF products actually have the ability to communicate across um, all the WAF instances and, and to get a, get a clearer picture, but it's a narrow vision. And the high rate, of, high rate of false positives and narrow vision means it doesn't actually know what's going on. It simply can just block things when it sees something wrong. Now, yes, there are, are um, more advanced WAF products out there. They're always improving, they're changing, but right now the state of WAFs in general don't solve this global behavioral analysis problem. They're just looking for attacks, uh, isolated, easy to identify attacks. Uh, but there's something about a WAF that's very important. The data that it produces is incredibly valid and incredibly useful, right? You can see signal. You can see that, hey, um, this person had a, had a part of their request. It was fishy. It triggered an alarm. And if I combine that with 
the other things, right? Um, maybe there's some other robotic identifications there. Maybe um, they did a bunch of stuff uh, in sequence that they shouldn't have done. Maybe they deviated, right? So a deviation mark and a WAF alert and the other things say, okay, you know what? This, is, this person is bad enough, I'm gonna go ahead and block them now, right? But it gives you a complete picture versus a broken picture of what this person is possibly trying to do. Now, you don't always get intent, but you can usually get enough signals to know that you wanna block somebody. Um, so as I was going through this, I thought maybe I'll do a summary, and then I realized um, that's no fun, uh, because uh, I'm sure at this point we wanna, ha we wanna have a, a small bit of bike shedding. Because what I talked about was a bunch of random things. Uh, and in particular, something that seems to be uh, a bike shedding moment is uh, why not Lua, why not Perl, why not write this stuff in a scripting language versus C, uh, for example. Um, so I want to talk about some of this stuff. And why do you use Redis, right? All these things that you talk about when you, when you see this, what are, what are the reasons why it ended up this way? Um, the reasons for C for me were multiple targets. Um, so I have multiple targets and a shared core, right? A patching engine next to the targets. Uh, there are also uh, underlying libra libraries that happen out of band. I wanted to do this once. Um, yes, the Lua support and Nginx is great. It's not so great in Apache. Um, the Perl support works in both places. Um, wasn't a huge fan of it, and it was a little bit slow. Um, and so C seemed like a nice common ground. Not always a nice common ground, but it was really, the, I think, the right choice, um, considering the idea I was going after. Um, the overhead of debugging a language that's not the language you're running at is tough, right? There's extensive time sunk, and, and if you look at the Cloudflare talks, right, they have invested a lot of time into optimizing Lua to make it as fast as it is. I'm really impressed with what they've done, but there's a heavy investment in optimization there. Um, we see in most cases, unless you write really, really poor algorithms, it kind of goes fast. Um, so the time investment, right, I'm not a Lua programmer, um, and this isn't my primary job. I needed to solve a problem and move on. Um, and so that's kind of the uh, other piece here. Performance, I'm gonna put a star next to, because the Cloudflare guys have very, very clearly demonstrated that Lua can be fast enough. Um, so for me, performance is immediate performance, not um, potential performance, right? Cloudflare, they've destroyed the myth that C is gonna be the, the, the fastest possible choice here for extensions. But tooling is really important. Um, I use Coverity for everything uh, that, I, that I check against. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff in the C tool chain that's actually nice to make sure that you're not gonna go crash a web server. Um, this is important, it runs at every single request. Um, this is the front door of everything that's gonna happen. Uh, if this goes down, everything will go down. Um, so if you're gonna write code at this level, you wanna make sure it's gonna actually work. Um, that's one of the biggest problems, uh, or biggest, you know, kind of fears of writing this kind of code is it's gonna crash everything if it goes wrong. So tooling is really important and making sure that you're not uh, gonna shoot yourself in the foot. Um, Redis is always a big question for me too. Why in the world would you possibly, why would you use Redis for this as, as an ephemeral cache? Um, for me, that's what Redis is, it's ephemeral cache, not a data store. It stores data structures temporarily for you. And uh, blacklists, IP address information, all that stuff changes, it rolls. It's a, it is ephemeral, right? Somebody might come from an IP and then it might change later. Uh, I don't wanna keep that stuff around forever. I wanna keep it around long enough to deal with it. And if it comes back, it'll come back, but um, we'll figure it out again. Uh, Redis has nice data structures. You can put things in the places that make sense. Um, the way they've, they've constructed this is nice. The access for pretty much all of the things I'm looking for is constant time. Um, it puts things together in a reasonable way. Um, they have an IC library uh, written by the guys who wrote Redis. Um, it works uh, really well, it's easy to link in, um, so low, low overhead, low effort. Uh, and the API is very nice. Um, it's fast enough. Redis actually is pretty fast when it comes down to it. Uh, as long as you keep the connection open and you're not paying that TCP or socket setup teardown cost, you're paying just the cost of a query, which is really, really fast. It's, it usually, it's, it's sub one millisecond for almost everything. Um, and there's a reasonable amount of operational experience with Redis across people I worked with. In general, there's documentation there. Um, yes, memcache is a reasonable alternative. Um, their APIs are just a little bit hairier, and Redis was easier to get started with. Um, it ended up being fast enough, and so I stuck with it. Uh, it doesn't mean it's gonna be permanently there, but it's definitely um, a reason. There's a few things that make this easier, right? Um, so there are things that are coming. Um, mod security team is actually building libmod security, which is an embeddable library. I used to, right now it's a module. There's one for Apache, there's one for Nginx, there's one for IIS. The one for Apache works, the other two don't. Um, when I say don't, I mean the entire set of functionality that is, does not exist in the other two versions. It's somewhat crippled or broken. 
Uh, libmod security actually will fix pretty much all of that and you can embed it in. So I'm gonna embed this into the module once it actually comes out as a, uh, you know, kind of in-between piece of a WAF. Um, just for certain parts, because mod security can be very slow. Um, there's one piece that I'm doing, and that's a command and processing daemon. So as you find signal, as you wanna put this into the cache, right, right now you have to put it in manually. That sucks. Um, you have to know what the key space looks like. You can fat finger it, you can get it wrong. What I really wanna do is be able to send a signal and say, hey, I just found this person, uh, I identified them as an anomaly, they're, they're malicious and intent, go ahead and blacklist them, right? Just send a signal, blacklist and username or IP, right? Just send that as a, as a message across to this space. It will put it in the cache, it will deal with it properly. Uh, and don't do the manual Redis manipulation nonsense. So I'm building that right now, and that will be an easier piece to kind of just pipe data into. Um, last for me is module development, the pros and cons of writing a module in Nginx. Um, I've written one for Apache, one for Nginx. Um, there's pros and cons for each, uh, but in particular, uh, there were some stumbling blocks for me. Um, there's good things, right? Um, I had way more confidence in the Nginx module that I wrote uh, because the data structure uses, the way, the way you compose a module and the Nginx kind of ecosystem that kind of forces you to use what's there, use the Nginx version, don't use the C library version, um, gives you a little more confidence that things are gonna happen the way they're supposed to. Uh, it's managed all within that ecosystem. So I like that. It's faster than the Apache module, flat out. Um, it, it, does, it performs a lot better. Um, but the hard part was getting started. There's not great documentation. Right? I, built this, I built the modules that I built uh, out of just reading source code. Um, yes, there's a couple of great guides to getting started, but they're not complete. And so most of it just comes from reading source code. Um, some things are just harder to do. Um, if I wanna get headers, I wanna like, loop through all the headers, it's a lot more to do than just loop through all the headers. Uh, there's certain examples, that uh, certain things you wanna do that are just more difficult in the Nginx world, there's no API for it. Um, you end up kind of, I mean, it's there, you can get the data, you can go through it, but it's just a little bit harder. And of course, the elephant in the room, which, I, which has, we've been told will be addressed as dynamic modules, right? Uh, every time a new version comes out, you have to rebuild Nginx and release it. Um, that makes it uh, you know, a little bit hairier operation-wise. So um, that's pretty much it. Um, a couple of links for you. Uh, the rep sheet project and all of the libraries and everything else are one, one, under one organization, uh, github.com slash rep sheet. Um, Repsheet.github.io, uh, this first link is basically a git book that describes how to deal with Nginx rep sheet, how to get it installed, what are the dependencies, that kind of stuff. Uh, LibRepSheet, uh, the core library, uh, has, a, has a GitHub page as well. That is um, documentation, code coverage. It's a C library, so I wanna make sure that you know, things are reasonable. Um, and then I have a much more complete version of the thought process that goes into um, the kind of things you wanna look for, how you wanna identify behavior, um, more than I could fit in this talk, uh, and that's this talk here um, in Australia last year about what is really, what does behavioral analysis really entail and how would you think about this problem as it, as it kind of pertains to the web? Um, so I think I have just a couple minutes for questions. Uh, so I'll quick take questions. So NATA traffic is a problem. The question was, do I, am I worried about NATA traffic? Actually, I'm worried about two things. NATA traffic and cell phone, mobile traffic. Uh, mobile traffic is, um, is just hopped between a range of IP addresses, right? Um, identifying the slider blocks for mobile carriers is actually something that you have to do. Because um, you'll watch somebody misbehave, and then you might block them, but then somebody else that's totally valid might come back on the same IP a minute later because they've just hopped IP addresses because that's just the way the carriers work. Um, that's a problem as well. Um, so you wanna be very careful about how you deal with that. So yes, NATA traffic and mobile carriers or mobile traffic is different and you have to work a little harder to make it work. Yeah. Oh, how yeah, many is this add in, yeah. So as I drew it, uh, we're, using, we're not using the mod security piece. Um, Akamai actually is feeding us some data down from their end, but if you measure the, the latency right at Nginx, we just have the, the Redis lookup and the act. That's really what we have in place. Uh, as long as the connection is set up, so you have that connection going on, you're not paying a TCP teardown or setup teardown cost, it's sub one millisecond. Um, 
it's, I mean, Redis is really fast. Um, now, you can do it two ways, right? You can have Redis somewhere else, and you have to pay the traffic hop to get there. Or you can just have Redis slaves, right? You have one master. Each, Redis, each Nginx instance has its own Redis slave. Where, and now you're going over loopback. So you're literally paying loopback costs to do a query on Redis. And as long as um, you're not something crazy, which this is doing a get, it's doing a lookup in a set. I mean, it's, it's, it's constant time for all the access. So you have to be very conscious of, of the query cost that you're making. But everything's been designed where it's constant time access for anything in real time or across the web server. Now, in the back end of processing, um, or out of band processing stuff, there is some larger cost queries, but basically the rule of thumb is if it's in line in the, web's, the web request, only constant time look up for queries. Um, so it's negligible overhead. Um, you really wouldn't notice it. You can measure it, you could uh, make sure, but you don't really see, especially for HTTP, right? It's eyeball time, so you can afford a millisecond or two, but it really the goal is always sub one millisecond. And, it is, and as, as a lookup cache, that's all it should be. So. One more question? Okay, thank you. Oh, oh, you have a question? Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs>